Well, it's all quiet on the storm tracker radar tonight, but you need to get ready for more rain. We're stuck in this wet weather pattern that shows no signs of letting up. Yeah, and check out this forecast. The next couple of days, we could see two to three more inches of rain in the triangle, lesser amounts farther to the north. That next round of rain, folks, could arrive before you wake up. Chief Meteorologist Patrick Vaughn joins us tonight with the latest on that timing. Well, it looks like, uh, again, uh, the chances of flash flooding overnight across southeast Texas, mainly the two thirds of our viewing area, southern two thirds of our viewing area has a slight risk of uh, flash flooding. Otherwise, nothing on radar. Temperatures are into the upper and middle 70s to around 80 and futurecast doesn't show much uh, overnight until the morning hours. But boy, there is lots of rain off towards our southwest with flooding rains off that way. At this point, I'm going to have to go with my experience rather than modeling. I don't trust it all that much. I do expect us to see a good chance of rain, uh, mainly rain uh, coming up uh, during the first half of the day, uh, particularly around 8, 9 o'clock in the morning for the triangle. Lesser amounts obviously up towards the lakes, but uh, you'll get that coming up in the afternoon. More scattering uh, during the afternoon for the triangle as temperatures slowly rise into the mid 80s and rain chances remain high right on through Saturday. Lower chances this weekend. More on that storm tracker forecast coming up on 12 News. Patrick, thank you. New tonight, Texas students will have some serious catching up to do this fall. Star test scores dropped dramatically in districts where the majority of students were learning virtually. Their math scores down 32 points. The number of students who met reading expectations fell by 9 percentage points when compared with 2019 data. So those numbers really show why the state wants everyone back in class this fall. But not everyone supports this idea. 12 News reporter Amelia White spoke with local parents, and some of them say their kids flourished while online learning. She's live to tell us more about their experiences. Jordan Dage, some parents don't think it's fair to force everyone back to, to the class. I spoke with two parents today who think virtual learning benefited their kids. Susan Gonzalez. If he had a virtual teacher like we did last year, definitely. And Tasha Davis are making it clear. Remote worked well for us, and we would definitely do it again if we had that option. Their kids actually benefited from online learning. But for districts across Southeast Texas, a full return to in-person learning is the only option. Not going to be simple, and my son is actually stressing it. He thought that he would actually have the opportunity to learn remote as well going into his senior year. Davis says she noticed a complete 180 with her son's academics when he moved to virtual instruction. I mean, his grades went from, from failing last school year to this school year, his grades went up, and the teachers recognized it as well. On the other hand, Gonzalez recognized the harm COVID-19 could bring to her family. It was about um, necessarily the unknown, not knowing what COVID would bring as far as the school year brought our kids. According to the Texas Tribune, 56% of Texas students returned to on-campus instruction in January. But here's a snapshot of exactly who returned. 75% of white students, 53% of black students, 49% of Hispanic students, and 31% of Asian students. Experts say students of color face different situations from their white counterparts while learning from home. Some took care of mom and dad. Others took jobs to supplement family income. But still, the Texas Education Agency says they should all come back to class this fall. The TEA saying while remote learning proved to be an effective option for a small subset of Texas public school students, in-person learning is much more effective at minimizing the educational impacts associated with major disruptions to learning such as COVID-19. So for some parents, the return to in-person learning will be an adjustment. I just know that it's going to be an uncomfortable situation for everyone. The TA tells us the main goal is to get all students back in class, regardless of their previous learning environment or individual circumstances. Live in studio, Amelia White, 12 News. Great perspective, Amelia. Now tonight, the world topped 4 million COVID-related deaths, a grim milestone as lots of people are starting to gather again. One Southeast Texas church says they're increasing their COVID protocols to protect kids who are just too young to be vaccinated as that Delta variant spreads. That's after more than 130 were infected at a summer church camp in Galveston County. Praise Church in Beaumont says it will be taking all kinds of precautions, temperature checks, social distancing, sanitizing, even contact tracing. Church officials say while it may be risky, a lot of growth can come from a week away at camp. 
And one of the biggest ways to mitigate the risk just comes down to good moral code. Be honest with what you've been around and being respectful of what you might expose other people to and considering others above yourself. Church officials say Lake Tomahawk will be hosting more than 400 children and teens. They'll be cleaning the campgrounds between each session's visit. Folks in Florida felt only a glancing blow from Tropical Storm Elsa, driving rains, gusting winds, and a violent surf. It was a bit intense, but not overwhelming. The storm made landfall in Florida early this morning. The threat now moving north into Georgia and the Carolinas. Flooding is a worry, as well as isolated tornadoes. Search crews, you know, in Florida had feared that the storm would impact their efforts at the site of that condo collapse, but that did not happen. But tonight, families of those who are missing face a difficult reality. The search for survivors has turned into a recovery mission. This after the largest one day jump in the death toll, 54 now confirmed dead, with as many as 86 people still unaccounted for. The officials there in Surfside say they have worked hard for two weeks. At this point, we have truly exhausted every option available to us in the search and rescue mission. So today is about beginning the transition to recovery so that we can help to bring closure to the families who've been suffering and waiting for news. The cause of the collapse still unknown. Miami officials, meantime, are reviewing the structural integrity of older city condo buildings, ones that are taller than five stories. Developing tonight, people in Port Nature say a new development along the riverfront is bringing some mixed reactions. While they appreciate the revenue it'll bring to their city, one neighborhood is upset about drivers cutting through their side street, putting the kids in danger. Those who live along Lano Street say they've had enough. Now they're turning to solutions. Residents say they've advocated for reducing the speed limit, putting a four-way stop in, and increasing police patrols on the street. Port Nature's police chief Paul Lemoyne says they're working towards the solution. We want to try to make it as easy as possible, either with signage or um, you know, redesigning intersections or something to give them to flow a different direction to hopefully that we can eliminate uh, the vast majority of those problems. Lemoyne says they've hired an engineering firm to study traffic flow in the area and have also increased police patrols. Well, right now, questions remain about what led to a deadly shooting earlier this week near Vider, one that took the life of a young father. The sheriff's office remains tight lipped. Yeah, we still don't have a motive, a suspect, nor the victim's name, but family have confirmed his identity as Brennan Flores. He just turned 21 and Jordan's sister Autumn reached out to us this afternoon to share a little bit about his life. She says Brennan was a very spirited wild child that was taken from us way too soon. He had so much potential to be a great contributor to society and sadly we will never get to see what he could have been. In case you missed it, we now know what led to a high speed chase yesterday. A state trooper tried to stop Anthony Cordopassi from Florida. He was going 92 in the westbound lanes of I-10 near Highway 62. Around 8 last night, Vider PD chased his Mercedes. They spiked two of his tires. Cordopassi made it west of Beaumont on I-10 on four flat tires before crashing halfway to Winnie. Police say the car was not stolen. Cordopassi did not have warrants. Tonight, he's still in the hospital recovering. Well, tonight, a Port Arthur man is sitting in the Jefferson County Jail on a half million dollar bond. Darius Stevenson had an outstanding felony warrant for possession of a weapon and a prohibited substance in a prohibited place. Rather, it was filed by Port Arthur ISD police. Schools are gun free zones. Five years ago today, five Dallas officers were killed, several others wounded after a gunman ambushed a peaceful protest in the downtown area. Today, the officers that lost their lives were honored with this ceremony at City Hall. Four of the officers belonged to Dallas PD. The other, Brent Thompson, was a DART officer. It was the deadliest attack on police officers in the U.S. since 9-11. Tonight, four suspected assassins have been killed and two have been arrested after Haitian President Jovenel Moniz was assassinated in an attack at his home. His wife was also shot. She's being treated in a Miami hospital. The country's interim prime minister called the killing a hateful, inhumane and barbaric act. Now, President Biden was asked about this situation in Haiti as he left the White House for Illinois. We need a lot more information, but it's, it's just, it's very worrisome about the state of Haiti. The 53-year-old ruled by decree for more than two years 
after the country failed to hold elections. The opposition has been demanding that he step down.